Hi, my name is Dr. Julian Navoa. I'm a practicing OBGYN and cosmetic surgeon in El Paso, Texas. I wanted to take a few minutes and discuss the top 12 questions, what I consider to be the top 12 questions to ask a potential OBGYN, specifically for delivery of your baby. Uh, what, we're, what the questions are designed for is to make it a little bit easier for you to ask some simple but straightforward questions to your OB. Some of these are kind of tough to ask and you might not get um, a very happy response, but they are important and so I wanted to take the, a few minutes to go over them. Number one, when asking or deciding on an OB, it's important to have an idea of how much experience that particular OB has. So first question uh, and answer is how many babies do you deliver and have delivered uh, in, your, in your career? Well, if you're asking me directly, I've delivered about 5,500 babies. I average 40 uh, deliveries a month. And in, in particular, that's important. A lot of people consider that to be a very busy practice, and it is generally a busy practice. With the national average being between 15 and 20, uh, we do quite a number of deliveries. 95% of the deliveries that I do are delivered by me. Uh, I do not sign out in a call group. I feel it's important to dedicate the majority of my time to my patients because when they're in labor, they would like to see me rather than a stranger or someone that they hardly know and that's who they've hired. They've hired me to deliver them and it's important for me to be there. Also related to the, uh, the amount of experience that we have, the more deliveries that a doctor has, generally speaking, it's probably the more experience that that particular doctor has. Uh, after 5,500 deliveries, I've seen quite a few unique uh, situations, but pretty much routine as well as uh, general high risk is what I've seen. But I feel very, very comfortable in doing OB uh, or obstetrics. And that's very important too, that you need to uh, find a doctor that feels comfortable doing obstetrics and has a significant amount of experience doing that particular uh, field of medicine. Uh, second question is, who am I gonna see when I go uh, to see you? Very important question because a lot of practices use uh, nurse practitioners or PAs. And uh, I have a nurse practitioner in my practice, but it's important that if you wanna go to or to see your doctor that you're going to see your doctor and not some other uh, person or how often are you going to see that doctor. In my practice I try to uh, keep an open door policy where the patient can see me if they choose to or they can see my nurse practitioner if uh, they choose to see my nurse practitioner who happens to be a female. And, uh, number question and answer number three, at what facilities do you have privileges? A lot of doctors only have privileges at one particular hospital. However, if it's across town, a, a patient may end up at a hospital that's closest to them. So it's important to have an idea of exactly what hospital you're going to deliver at and how close is that hospital for the, both the patient and the, and the physician. I have privileges at four hospitals and all of the uh, three of the four hospitals are with a three minute drive from my home uh, with the fourth hospital being approximately 10 to 15 minute drive from my home. Very, very, the next question and answer is very, very touchy. And I think, uh, and specifically, it is how many babies do you deliver vaginally and how many by cesarean section? This is an extremely important question to ask, especially since I consider that, that we as OBGYNs are not doing enough to improve the quality uh, of care of our particular case, uh, patients. We are increasing every year the rate of cesarean section without a significant improvement in the outcome to our patients. In 1970s, the cesarean section rate was 5%. It is now over 35% and continuing to go higher and higher. And this is, and for all intents and purposes, for uh, has more to do with the doctor than it has to do with the patient. And this has to change. So in answering that question, of the 5,500 deliveries that I've, that I've uh, had, uh, I've delivered approximately 95% of those babies by vaginal delivery and 5% by uh, cesarean section. This is a, a tentative, uh, tentative number. I don't want to be held to it, but that's the number that I quote my patients when they ask me, well, what is your C-section rate? Well, of the 40 deliveries I do per month, approximately 5% are cesarean section, 95% are vaginal delivery. It's important to understand that because with a higher and higher number of deliveries, there's a higher and higher chance of a cesarean section. And if your doctor has a 45 to 50 percent cesarean section rate, which is not uncommon, then you may want to choose another doctor. Uh, there is a great amount of flexibility related to doing uh, uh, deliveries, and you need to uh, choose a doctor who is dedicated 
uh, to following the standards established by the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, who uh, they, as well as NIH and the World Health Organization, feel we're not doing quite enough. Or actually, in some cases, we're doing a poor job of providing the care and keeping the cesarean section rate down. The next question and answer has to do with uh, uh, the vaginal birth after cesarean section. When a patient has had a cesarean section and requests to have the next baby by vaginal delivery, that's called a trial of labor after cesarean or a TOLAC. If the trial of labor after cesarean is successful, then it's called a VBAC or a vaginal birth after cesarean. So the TOLAC is before, the VBAC is after. A lot of practices, the majority of practices uh, here in El Paso do not offer or routinely offer the trial of labor or the VBAC. It is because of a number of reasons, uh, but the most common reason is because once in labor, the patient, the doctor has to be in-house the entire labor, and that can be anywhere between 12 and 20, uh, between 6 and 12 hours on average, uh, and that makes it very difficult for the doctor to be present uh, for the entire labor. The other thing is that there is an increased risk of complications related to doing a trial of labor, and most doctors do not want to uh, risk or be drawn into an issue where there could be an increased risk leading to cesarean section. The final point, which is touchy but true, is economics. Uh, we do not get paid, in general, we do not get paid more for the trial of labor, and therefore it's much, much easier to do a cesarean section in 15 minutes than to spend 12 hours with a patient uh, for her to do a vaginal delivery. Here in El Paso, I'm one of the few doctors that do do trial of labors or VBACs. And uh, specifically, I do approximately six per month. Uh, it's important for me to offer this service. I believe that my patients appreciate the fact that I'm willing to spend 12 hours in the hospital with them. And uh, the, the success rate is approximately 90% of my patients who do an attempted trial of labor will be able to deliver vaginally. Next point, very important point number six would be who is going to cover you, who is going to cover your doctor uh, on the weekends and during holidays or during the week. Most patients do not understand that doctors will be part of a call group so for them to have some time off. But if the larger and larger the call group, the more likely it is that you will not be delivered, you will not be delivered by your physician on a weekend or holiday. So you have to have an understanding of who's going to cover for that particular doctor and if you're okay with it, somebody else covering for that particular doctor. In my particular case, I rarely sign out. I'm usually available 24-7. Uh, but for other practices, which is very common, is to sign out every weekend. So if there are four doctors in the call group, it's important for you to understand or have an idea of who those other doctors are and what is their complication rate, what is their cesarean section rate. So that's a little bit of homework on your part. Uh, question in point number seven, do you use or do you recommend induction of labor in order uh, to deliver a patient? What is the complication rate associated with an induction of labor? An induction of labor is when a doctor uh, recommends or offers to uh, give the patient medicine in order to provoke contractions in order to lead to a delivery and hopefully a vaginal delivery. Now the most common complication related to induction of labor is failure. If you, and this is very, very important because if you start out with a 35 to 40% uh, rate of cesarean section and you induce a patient, then the rate of cesarean section can increase. Then you can, it can lead to a 50% chance of a cesarean section. And a lot of patients don't understand that if they would have just waited a few more days for natural labor, the risk of a cesarean section would have been significantly reduced. So when I quote a patient what my risk of uh, complication to an induction is, it's approximately 5% equal to the spontaneous labor. So in my practice, 5% of my patients will deliver, uh, deliver by cesarean section in natural labor. 5% of my patients will deliver by cesarean section with induction. And that's on average how, what it's been since 1999. Uh, question eight, do you routinely use medication to control labor pain? Do you recommend the epidural? Do you, or do you encourage your patient to deliver by natural childbirth? I encourage my patient to deliver by the birth plan that she's designed. If she wants to deliver by natural childbirth, I'm all for that. If for Lamaze, I'm all for that. The use of a doula is encouraged. Uh, but if a patient would prefer not to feel anything, I, I, I offer uh, the epidural upon request. And that is a 
may or may not be different according to other practices, but I do offer pain medication as soon as the patient becomes uncomfortable. I think it's very important to, to make uh, the experience as memorable and as painless as possible for the particular patient because it can be a long, long labor sometimes. Question number nine, how, do you, uh, how can you be reached during an emergency? And do you use an answering service uh, or a nurse to screen your phone calls? I do not use nurses or uh, answering services to screen my phone calls. I have cellular telephones and my patients can get in touch with me in cases of an emergency after hours. During hours is during the office hours. They can reach me through the office, but after hours, they can reach me by cellular phone. This is important, especially in true emergencies where a delay of, few, of a few minutes or five minutes can be significant. And in those cases, it's recommended that you just go directly to the hospital for care. Question number 10, how many family members or friends do you allow to bring in for your appointments or to the hospital when you deliver? Uh, am I allowed to film my delivery? Number one, uh, during for regular appointments, it's recommended that the, that the husband come and one additional family member sometimes can be allowed. Uh, because the practice is so large, it is difficult to have uh, people in, more than just the, uh, the, the husband come to my appointments, but it's important to ask those questions so that you will not be upset uh, or in any way discouraged about bringing a family member. I strongly encourage the, the husband or the father of the baby to come to each and every appointment. At the hospital, it's based on hospital policy. Normally I, I offer or I, I'm okay with two family members being in the, in the room, the father and uh, the, the mother-in-law or the mother of the, uh, the patient is uh, encouraged to be present. Sometimes we can allow three people in the room. Uh, the use of the um, uh, filming, I have no issue or problem with filming. However, the hospital or uh, hospitals may have issues with filming, so you're going to have to check that out with the particular hospital. How uh, much experience do you have? Next question, number 11. How much experience do you have with high risk patients and complicated patients? Well, uh, about 10 to 15 percent of my practice has to do with high risk patients, and I always encourage uh, a pay, uh, a doctor to get second opinion with a maternal fetal medicine specialist or a parentologist. Uh, the, the ones here locally that I use are Dr. Velasquez and Dr. Harless. They're awesome uh, doctors and I strongly encourage high-risk uh, patients to seek second opinion with these particular doctors. Uh, last point, if I choose you as my doctor, what is this, the expected cost if I deliver vaginally versus by, by cesarean section? This is extremely important. Now, for insurance purposes, everyone knows that cesarean sections cost more. So there's an increased deductible, there's an increased overall uh, pay for, for the services rendered. Specifically, the doctor gets paid for the cesarean, an assistant gets paid for assisting that particular doctor. There's more time in the hospital, there's more expense in the hospital. So this is extremely important. If you plan on having a vaginal delivery, you're going to need to find a doctor with a low C-section rate because if they have a 30, 40, or 50 percent C-section rate, you're going to see your risk of getting a cesarean section significantly increase and your overall costs are going to significantly increase. Now, if you're a self-pay, you're going to have to factor this in from the very beginning. Again, if you choose a doctor who has a significantly high cesarean section rate, your chances of overall cost significantly increase in this particular circumstances as well. So it's a very, very important to understand what that C-section rate is from the very beginning and what the cost differences are going to be between vaginal delivery and cesarean section. I hope that these 12 questions and answers have been uh, beneficial for you and if you have any further questions, and specifically my patients, please feel free to contact us at the office. Thank you very much.